Good morning, everybody. Ciao, come on, I'm Elliot here. Hope you're all doing well. So today, I'm going through a list of things I wrote down last year that I should make a video about. And the list was countries that rock. These are 10 countries I have visited between 2010 and 2019 in my first nine years of uh, travel. So, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been traveling solo since April 2010, and I've always done all my travels on my own. I've never traveled with any family, I've never traveled with friends, I've never even had a girlfriend in my life. Because, you know, not having a girlfriend, uh, it doesn't stop me from traveling, although, you know, when you travel and you're in a big bed like this, you're like, oh man, I wish I had a girlfriend to have fun with. So, anyway, let's get it going. Number one on my list, Nicaragua. I was in Nicaragua in December 2018. I was traveling from Cancun all the way to Costa Rica without flying. So, I drove from the Honduran capital, don't ask me to pronounce it, to Managua. The capital of Nicaragua, I passed through towns like Leon and Granada on the way. And I kind of wish I could have stopped off there, but I thought, oh yeah, I've got to go to Managua. It's Christmas Eve, and the memorable, the most, the most memorial thing that ever happened to me in Managua was I met a Afro Nicaraguan who spoke fluent English to me. It all happened Christmas Eve night. I am trying to find the park with the tall silhouette of Augusto C. Sandino. And so I'm walking up the boulevard and I see all the signs explain the history of Nicaragua and what happened during the war times. I see a Afro Nicaraguan police officer and he says to me, Can I help you, sir? Just like that, instead of. Because he, he, normally I'd, I'd be expecting somebody to say something in Spanish. And I said, Is the park with uh, Sandino's silhouette open, and he said, like, Santo? He thought it was Christmas time, so he thought I was talking about Santa Claus. So I said, no, you're a national hero. So he said, the park will be closed now, but it will be... So I, I said, uh, will it be reopened tomorrow on Christmas Day? And he said, yeah, sure. I said, well, have a Merry Christmas. And he wished me Merry Christmas. The next day, that same police officer is there. And he told me about his people along the Caribbean coast, uh, who they speak English because th that part of Nicaragua was actually under the British control and he recommended that I visited Corn Island. I was really happy to have Christmas in Managua, Nicaragua because two years prior I had a really crap Christmas in Scotland because my dad's stupid family in Yorkshire gave me the cold shoulder so I ended up having Christmas in a flop house in Glasgow. So I always made myself the effort not to be in Britain uh, over Christmas. I've had to be in Britain the last two Christmases because of various reasons. But it's, it's, I, I think I should say to everybody, try to spend Christmas in a different continent that you don't live on. I mean, I've already had Christmas in Asia, North America, in Europe. I'm kind of going aiming that I be in Africa this Christmas, but even if it's not possible or not. Okay, number two, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Many years ago, I met a guy called Lani in Sydney, and he was Persian. He was studying music. And unfortunately, his visa expired, and he went back to live in Tehran. So I promised him that I would go to Tehran and visit him one day. And he says, yeah, that'd be cool. We can do lots of cool stuff. So I told this Rhodesian lady who would sit outside my cafe at Borkham Hills, and she told me that Iran wasn't safe. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go Iran and I'm gonna prove this racist woman wrong. So I went through all the paperwork to apply for an Iranian visa. I had to pay somebody with a Swiss bank account 60 euros for a sponsorship code. And then after getting the sponsorship code, they tell it, it telexed my visa to the Iranian embassy in Canberra, where I posted my shitty Australian passport to the Iranian embassy it gets stuck in. So I got to the Islamic Republic of Iran on the border with uh, Turkey by taking a train from Istanbul. 
and I spent a couple of days hanging out with my friend Hani. To me, I am more in love with the Islamic Republic of Iran. I have a lot of respect for Khomeini, Khamenei. I, I cannot stand Western governments talk shit about the Iranian regime or the Iranian government because prior to the revolution, Iran was really dumb. It had really high illiteracy rates and everything was like fixed just like that. So you can all complain about all human rights or people being mistreated because of religion and all and that just doesn't bother me. What bothers me is xenophobia and racism against Iranian people because one time my cousin was dating this woman and I told her I went to Iran she was like, yuck! You went to Iran? Iranian people, yuck! And so I told my Iranian stoner friend about this woman's opinion and, and he said people who do not travel are naive fucking buffoons. So I do not care that I have jeopardized any chances of ever going back to America just because I spent five days in the Islamic Republic of Iran hanging out with my Iranian atheist stoner friends. I just don't care. There's lots of other countries in the world for me to visit. Uh, number three, uh, Sweden. I have always had a lot of respect for Olive Palm, for what he did for Sweden. I've always had a lot of respect for the Swedish government in arming Southern African liberation movements and, you know, arming the Viet Cong and arming uh, the uh, Sandistrias in Nicaragua. The negative thing is that in Sweden, right, they won't give you a national insurance number, like a personal number, unless you have a job contract. Even if you're an EU citizen, you have to have a year's contract to get a ID number. So that is ID number, you basically can't open a bank account in Sweden. And the dumbest thing I have ever experienced in two job interviews with a Swedish employer, was people asked me, oh, why you moved to Sweden? I felt like I could say that I hate the shit out of the United Kingdom because of all the racist people and the xenophobic people, and I'm a communist, but I basically chucked the spurs at these employers for not hiring me. I said, Olive Palm would kick your ass if you were still alive today, and two, you don't ask people why they went to Sweden. Just think about it. In Sweden, look, there's Iranians, there's Africans, there's South Americans, there's all sorts of Europeans, there's Jewish people, there's Gypsies, there's Arabs, there's, you know, black and white Africans, there's North Americans, there's Australian people. You don't ask people why they moved to Sweden in a job interview. Anywhere in the world, you don't ask why they move, because literally, it's none of your business. Okay, number four, Serbia. I went to Serbia first in August 2015. I was quite really sad at the time of my life because I turned down a job in Birmingham, so I started traveling, and I ended up in like Serbia on a Sunday evening, and maybe sad. I stayed in a nice hostel that actually had a bathtub. And even though my time in Serbia was short, I told myself I would come back eventually. And I did. I went back to Serbia last year. I spent three and a half weeks in Novi Sad, Belgrade, and Nice. And even though there's some dumbass people in Serbia lied to me saying that Bulgaria was closed, I had a really good 35th birthday, you know, visiting the museum where Joseph Broz Tito was buried. So that was a good way to celebrate my 35th birthday. Number five, Armenia. I have a lot of res love and respect for the people of Armenia. I don't really give a shit about the Kardashians. I really love System of a Down. I've been to Armenia once in 2017. And the Armenian people will always have my back. I will always be supportive of them. And because of that, I don't ever think I will visit Turkey ever again in my life. Number six, Kyrgyzstan, okay, a country in the Central Asia, part of the stands, former Soviet state, they speak Kyrgyz as their national language. I went there after a trip to Almaty, where I took the bus to Bishkek, and on the border, the Kazakh border guards tried to bribe me out of 50 quid for no particular reason. So I entered Bishkek, nice country, 
clean, beautiful, peaceful, no, not so much turbulent times as it was in 2017. I kind of wish I travelled through more of the Central Asia, but, you know, I had a job in London to do, and I had a nest egg to build up also in London. So, you better start going to Kyrgyzstan way before more of the backpackers start flooding like Bishkek. Number seven, uh, Papua New Guinea. If you are going to travel to Australia and New Zealand, I specifically tell you this one thing. Don't bother, okay? Do not bother wasting your money in Australia and New Zealand. They are white-run countries run by imperialism and bullshit I don't approve of as a communism person. I believe that you should visit a Pacific island nation. And I had a fun time in Papua New Guinea. I went to Port Moresby on a two-day uh, trip, even though I had to deal with some bullshit questioning by Australian authorities on the way out, which I literally, in my own mind, told them to go fuck themselves, and I told them that I hate Australia. I had a fun time in Papua New Guinea. I was driven around Port Moresby with my driver, as it's not really a safe place to go on foot. I visited the parliament, I visited a lot of churches, mosques, or past a brewery, and I met a lot of amazing people. And the funny thing was, I stayed in a local lady's house. The people of Papua New Guinea are close to my heart, and I recommend that you visit Papua New Guinea. And one crazy thing you should try and do is you should try and cross the border between West Papua, which is Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. You may or might not get uh, injured because there is a conflict going on, but it's a really rad border to cross. Okay, now number eight, uh, Suriname. I was in Suriname less than two years ago for my 34th birthday. It's a Dutch-speaking country in the north of South America, uh, in the Guyana region, because back in the day it was called Dutch Guyana. Paramaribo is one of the only places in the world you can actually see like a mosque and a synagogue side by side. Like, they built a synagogue in the Dutch colonial days, and then in 1984 they built a mosque right next to it. So it was just mind-blowing, just walking past it at night, going, wow, religion can totally coexist. People do speak English there, but um, do try to learn a couple of Dutch phrases to make them, like, smile. You'll have a really good mixture of people. You'll have, like, Maroons, that means, like, African slaves who escaped. You have Amerindians. You've got Javanese people from Indonesia. You've got um, South Asian people from, like, India. And then also you've got the typical, like, Dutch migrants to Suriname. So, Suriname, beautiful country. Five different types of people. Go visit there, but you may have to spend some money on a visa. No offense. Uh, number nine, Timor Leste, or East Timor. Growing up in Australia, I was really passionate about East Timor becoming an independent nation. I was very sad when Indonesian gangs started ransacking Dili after the referendum results. So then the bullshit Australian military came in to bring about like law and order. It was like a three year occupation. And then Timor Leste finally became independent in 2002 after like 500 years of Portuguese rule and like 24 years of Indonesian occupation. Timor Leste doesn't really have good infrastructure compared with neighboring Indonesia. They're like one of the poorest nations of Southeast Asia. And everything is imported. That's why it is very much more expensive than Indonesia. But you should go there because it's only one of two countries in Asia that is of a majority of Catholic. Like in the Philippines, people do speak Portuguese and uh, Tutum. Um, but getting there, it's quite a bit of a challenge. You either get, get an expensive flight from Singapore, an expensive flight from Darwin, or you, know, you get a cheap flight that goes from like either Jakarta or Bali. I had to fly from Darwin to Timor for, for my visit and then I decided to fly to Indonesia for a couple of days because I needed to get to Singapore and I'd already been to Indonesia once and yeah but, but also you will 
I think s some countries you still have to pay like 30 US dollars to get into East Timor, but it's well worth it and you'll have everlasting memories. Uh, number 10, uh, another one close to my heart, Lebanon. I pretty much had no ambitions of going to like Lebanon in like the last, well, 10 years, but then all of a sudden, you know, my uncle died of a heart attack in 2012. And then my friend gave me some poetry from the Prophet, from Carla Gibran. And then years later, I saw my favorite band, Dream Theater, in Birmingham. And they had incorporated some of his poetry into their song, Breaking All Illusions. So, after my grandma died in Yorkshire in June 2017, I told myself that I've got to go to Bashari, I've got to go to the Gibran Museum, and I've got to buy a copy of the Prophet from Bashari at the Gibran Museum, and I've got to thank Colour Gibran for getting me through these hard times. I believe every man and woman in the world should have a copy of the Prophet in their library. It's like the third best-selling book of all time after like Shakespeare and... Um, yeah, and some other Chinese author and all. I really don't recommend a visit to Beirut. I thought Beirut was very tacky. I mean, it was quite just bone shivering to you know walk past the Parliament of Lebanon and then see all those fashionable shops in downtown Beirut. It just that was like cringe worth. Although I did walk to um, uh, Pigeon Rocks. Yes, yeah, so I walked from. Downtown Beirut, all the way to Pigeon Rocks. So that was a nice time. But if you go to Lebanon, spend less time in Beirut and more times, like, outside of Beirut. Anyway, I'm Martin Millhead. I'm over and out.